dreamt a dream. What can it mean? And that I was a maiden queen, guarded by an angel mild. Witless woe was ne'er beguiled. And I wept both night and day. And he wiped my tears away. And I wept both day and night. And hid from him my heart's delight. So he took his wings, and fled. And then the morn blushed rosy red. I dried my tears and armed my fears with ten thousand shields and spears. Soon my angel came again. I was armed. He came in vain. For the time of youth was fled. And grey hairs were on my head. William Blake, the angel. William Blake was regarded as both a visionary and a madman. After his passing, he was reappraised by critics, including the pre-Raphaelite writer William Michael Rossetti, who considered Blake a glorious luminary. There lay still the question of his visions, one of those aspects that left critics and biographers both fascinated and perplexed. Some, like G.K. Chesterton, accepted Blake's visions without trying to explain them, and defended Blake's right to experience the inexplicable. When Blake lived at Felpham, angels appear to have been as native to the Sussex trees as birds. Hebrew patriarchs walked on the Sussex Downs as easily as if they were in the desert. Some people will be quite satisfied with saying that the mere solemn attestation of such miracles marks a man as a madman or a liar, but that is a shortcut of sceptical dogmatism which is not far removed from impudence. Surely we cannot take an open question like the supernatural and shut it with a bang, turning the key of the madhouse on all the mystics of history. To call a man mad because he has seen ghosts is, in a literal sense, religious persecution. It is denying him his full dignity as a citizen because he cannot be fitted into your theory of the cosmos. It is disfranchising him because of his religion. It is just as intolerant to tell an old woman that she cannot be a witch as to tell her that she must be a witch. In both cases, you are setting your own theory of things inexorably against the sincerity or sanity of human testimony. Such dogmatism at least must be quite as impossible to anyone calling himself an agnostic as to anyone calling himself a spiritualist. You cannot take the region called the unknown and calmly say that though you know nothing about it, you know that all its gates are locked. You cannot say, this island is not discovered yet, but I am sure that it has a wall of cliffs all around it and no harbour. That was the whole fallacy of Herbert Spencer and Huxley when they talked about the unknowable instead of about the unknown. An agnostic like Huxley must concede the possibility of a Gnostic like Blake. We do not know enough about the unknown to know that it is unknowable. From William Blake by G. K. Chesterton Visions of angels past and present are frequently reinterpreted today as, among other things, meetings with extraterrestrials. Aside from those encounters put down to dreams, mirages, illusions and ghosts, there is an increasing acceptance of the possibility that such meetings do occur, and that if they occur now, they could have occurred in the past. And if in the past, uh, why not to such as William Blake? Did he experience powerful dreams or visions? Did he encounter phantoms or aliens? On what psychic plane did he travel? He refers to meeting a mixture of angels, visitors, spirits and phantoms. Swedenborg discussed visitors from other planets, and Blake was familiar with Swedenborg referencing him in his letters. Blake also mentions meeting the spirits of Paracelsus and Burma, whom he described as his greatest influences. Burma was a 16th century philosopher, mystic and theologian. Like Blake, he experienced visions and reinterpreted them in his writings. He was influenced by Paracelsus. Paracelsus, also living in the 16th century, was a physician, philosopher and alchemist, and he appears to have been an early student of psychology in his analysis of the power of the imagination, although this was couched in terms of his alchemical teachings. Or rose thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. It has been suggested that Blake had Paracelsus in mind when he wrote The Sick Rose, 
and that the poem describes a form of telepathic passion that travels the air between sympathetic spirits. Blake's criticism of the church included its enforced celibacy, in particular regarding monks and nuns, which he found perverse and unhealthy. In this, he shares the views of Paracelsus, who also regarded monasteries and convents as unhealthy places filled with the demons of repressed desires. Thus, it could be that the destruction of the rose, assailed by the worm, is a reference to a form of telepathic infection, with the worm serving as a metaphor for succubus or incubus. From here, it is not too difficult to see how an alienist theory might interpret the poem in terms of an extraterrestrial encounter. The invisible worm flies through the storm. In some accounts, extraterrestrials are described as appearing suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, and often accompanied by meteorological turbulence. As to what aliens want, well, when they are not experimenting on cattle or performing miraculous cures, they do seem to go in for encounters of a more intimate kind, such as in the case of Antonio Villas Boas in the 1950s, whose story describes him being abducted in order to mate with a female alien aboard a UFO. One more detail connects several of these first-hand accounts. After the encounter, the human abductee shows signs of radiation sickness. Oh, Rose, thou art sick. With a lot of cautions, but simple the law of attraction, or the fact that we are able to... You know, we are, where is the, the energy of the universe and whatever you think... You are able to bring it. And I think Jung said once, not directly talking about the law of attraction, but he said, I always thought in my heart there was something that was guiding me. In a way, I didn't know why, but I knew what I had to do. So there yeah. was a kind of connection, some spiritual connection or guidance or something. I knew. I didn't know why. I didn't know what. But I knew it was calling me, or it was guiding me, in a sense. Jung and Blake shed many ideas, and when Jung came to create his Red Book, he integrated images with text in ways that were noticeably similar to William Blake's. Like Blake, he explored his imagination, visions or fantasies, as he called them, and dreams. Unlike Blake, he sought to examine and analyze the subconscious mind. Jung found Blake a tantalizing study since he compiled a lot of half or undigested knowledge in his fantasies. According to my ideas, they are an artistic production rather than an authentic representation of unconscious processes. From Jung's Letters, Volume 2. Did you know that Jung also wrote about UFOs? I didn't know. And, well, something does ring a bell vaguely. I came across something, but a while ago. Let me just check this now. I was walking at night in the streets of a city. Interplanetary machines appeared in the sky, and everyone fled. The machines looked like large steel cigars. I did not flee. One of the machines spotted me and came straight towards me at an oblique angle. I think Professor Jung says that one should not run away, so I stand still and look at the machine. From the front, seen close to, it looked like a circular eye, half blue, half white. From Flying Saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the skies by Carl Jung. He's more interested in the phenomenon, in the psychic aspect. He had, he had friends and family collect data from all the different, I guess, witness accounts, well, yeah, witness accounts, all the different sources. I myself recently dreamed that a UFO came speeding towards me, which turned out to be the lens of a magic lantern, whose projected image was myself. This suggested to me that I was the figure, himself deep in meditation, who is produced by a meditating yogi. C.G. Jung it's interesting just because Blake has been compared with Jung in a sense as being a kind of proto-Jung, but it's not coming from a scientific God. perspective. There was, you know, you, you talked about the lizard people. Yeah. And I remember it was, uh, I think it was, there was a legend, you know, like all the 
Aztecs, Civilization, or Incas, Civilization. I try to remember which one. I think it was Aztecas. You know, there was an, you know, when you see the temples, they said you can't make them today like the way they are. Like, it's like pyramids. It's like it's done in such a way. You don't know, you know, how it could be made. And there is a legend that when the Spanish, you know, the conquistadors came to it, before they came, sorry, there was uh, all the people were actually under the control. Probably it was in a, like um, a title. It was called the, the Serpent King. And so they wanted the knowledge for them. So the, these family of serpent people left, you know, the temples. We don't know where they went, but they left. They left the people. And a lot of theories <laughs> tend to see like some of the great monarchs come actually from this family. It's actually probably the real lizard people <laughs> for <laughs> hiding in secret in a way. The Aztec god, Wewe Coyoto, is the god of music, dance, song and mischief. Although he looks like a coyote, he also rules the calendar day of the lizard. Meanwhile, the Mayans celebrated the rain god Chak, a reptilian being with fangs and a long nose, and several rulers took the name of White Lizard or Blue Lizard. Reptilian gods appear in ancient mythologies across the world. Blake used reptiles in some of his imagery, such as an illustration for the Book of Job. The plate is entitled, With dreams upon my bed thou scarest me and affrightest me with visions, and depicts a being floating above the sleeper, with hooves for feet and an iridescent serpent bound about its body, seemingly one with the being. As a side note, Carl Jung wrote the answer to Job while on his sickbed in a fever. According to one account, a figure came to him and dictated the work to him. Jung himself described the experience as hellish and goes on to say, and at each step I felt hindered by a beatific vision of which I'd better say nothing. Flying saucers are a modern myth of things seen in the sky. And he wrote it in the 1950s. He described himself as a sceptic, but he was intrigued by this, this psychic aspect as he saw it. He saw flying saucers as a modern myth in the making, and he sees them as visionary rumours. Huh. Yeah, I, I think it's quite an interesting book to go into. But curious that he, he isn't quoted very often <laughs> whenever they're talking about UFOs. You don't hear Jung <laughs> mentioned very much. It's like, okay, Carl, we'll keep your ideas about UFOs. <laughs> we'll, we'll call you. <laughs> we'll let you know. <laughs> so, well, we, we're going to... Let's let's focus on your symbolism and collective memory of the world, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> hey, come on, Carl. Come on, Carlo. Just we know there's something out there. You know there is. We almost have the proof. We almost have it. <laughs> it's so weird to see like how many, and I didn't know. Like I knew for some offers, like interested, like in spiritism, uh, all the the ghosts and all that, but Nyong. Blake uh, being like interested in you know the the lizard people the extraterrestrial I'm like what <laughs> it's, it so sounds strange. it does sound yes yeah, quite quite sort of it's like it doesn't and so unlike them isn't it but it's it's when you start looking into it and you you look at the pictures and you think well. The beauty of Blake's poetry lies in its very obliqueness, its combination of extreme simplicity and ambiguity. We don't know that he saw ghosts, angels or aliens. We don't know if he travelled on different planes or really saw his brother's spirit ascend the heavens, clapping its hands as it went. We can't say one way or the other, as we weren't there at the time. All we can know is what we receive every time we read his work, and every time the tale can be a different one. As with Shakespeare, we can place a multitude of meanings and interpretations. It can be spiritual, down-to-earth, abstract, symbolic, conceptual. It's up to us. The freedom Blake believed in, he left to us in his legacy. My friend the angel climbed up from his station into the mill. I remained alone, and then this appearance was no more. 
but I found myself sitting on a pleasant bank beside a river by moonlight, hearing a harper who sung to the harp, and his theme was, The man who never alters his opinion is like standing water and breeds reptiles of the mind. But I arose and sought for the mill, and there I found my angel, who, surprised, asked me how I escaped. I answered, All that we saw was owing to your metaphysics. For when you ran away, I found myself on a bank by moonlight, hearing a harper. But now we have seen my eternal lot. Shall I show you yours? He laughed at my proposal, but I by force suddenly caught him in my arms and flew westerly through the night till we were elevated above the earth's shadow. Then I flung myself with him directly into the body of the sun. Here I clothed myself in white and, taking in my hand Swedenborg's volumes, sunk from the glorious clime and passed all the planets till we came to Saturn. Here I stayed to rest and then leapt into the void between Saturn and the fixed stars. Here, said I, is your lot. In this space, if space it may be called. Soon we saw the stable and the church, and I took him to the altar and opened the Bible. And lo, it was a deep pit, into which I descended, driving the angel before me. Soon we saw seven houses of brick. One we entered. In it were a number of monkeys, baboons, and all of that species, chained by the middle, grinning and snatching at one another, but withheld by the shortness of their chains. However, I saw that they sometimes grew numerous, and then the weak were caught by the strong, and with a grinning aspect, first coupled with and then devoured by plucking off first one limb and then another, till the body was left a helpless trunk. This, after grinning and kissing it with seeming fondness, they devoured too, and here and there I saw one savourily picking the flesh off his own tail. As the stench terribly annoyed us both, we went into the mill, and I in my hand brought the skeleton of a body, which in the mill was Aristotle's analytics. So the angel said, Thy fantasy has imposed upon me, and thou oughtest to be ashamed. I answered, We impose on one another, and it is but lost time to converse with you whose works are only analytics. From A Memorable Fancy, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell by William Blake Thank you.